All right. Well, let's go ahead and get us started. I am Jody, and I am here with my good buddy. Mark, it's we, me. And we are the... Face Nerds! Yay! And today we're here with... Karina Reichman! Hey! <laughs> Is that what you wanted from me? Like, you know, I liked what you guys were up to. With the yeah, whole, no, that's you, a, know. You, you picked up what we were putting down for sure. For sure. That's sick. Say. That's sick. That's just improv, baby. That's yeah, yeah and, did it. And, and now we're done. Now the... Yeah. the... <laughs> and just over. Uh, where can people find you? <laughs> <laughs> um... Nowhere. They can't find me at all, ever. You'll never <laughs> find me again. Uh... You'll never catch me, Kappa. Yeah. Uh, all right. So... I just want to make a quick adjustment on my microphone so I don't peek. All right. Well, I, I so I'll be honest, like uh, I what Mark introduced me to you and your music and I was like very blown away. And I I am not a liar. I'm not just saying that to say that. But I was like, I like turned I went to your Spotify and I was like, OK, OK, all right what are these effects you are using? What are these tones you are using? Like I, I was definitely like, uh, very impressed. So, uh, I don't know where to start, but I, the one thing that stuck out to me is like, uh, I, you're definitely using a handful of effects. Can we talk a little bit about your pedal setup and your rig setup? Of course. Uh, Why looks... not? Why else are we here? No. <laughs> looks like there might even uh, be some pedals behind you. What's on that? There's dark? so many pedals behind me. I mean, Proco uh, just kind of, I guess, sponsored me and just sent me every rat known to man. Nice. So I have about 12 rats sitting over there, all different eras and sizes and shapes and all that's, kinds of crazy shit. That's appropriate uh, for New York City, just yeah. having a shitload of rats <laughs> in your rats, house. A ton of rats, dude. A ton of rats. I love yeah. my life. Yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. And actually, uh, True Five Pedals built me. It's sitting right here. So look, I have the... Uh, what? The I, because <laughs> I play, oh! a, I have this custom built rat pack by TrueFi that, of course, is gold. Because for the record, here I know I'm going to be really ADD this interview because that's the Karina way. But check this out, ready? It was a gold oh! rat to match oh! my gold custom base. You know what oh! I'm saying? Don't. Oh, baby. Oh, girl. <laughs> Now, if you're just listening to this podcast, you can't see what's going on here. But if you're watching it, you see that I am holding up a custom gold base built by a gentleman in Pennsylvania named Zeke Guitars. Oh, my God, Jody. Come on. Oh. What the ever? Wait, is that a Sarek? What, what is that? What's going on with that? Is that a Sarek? A gold Sarek? Is that a gold oh, Sarek right there? My I God. Like, with all, I don't what? know if you can see the checking. What Let's color fight. gold do you have? Is it just gold? This, it's gold sparkle. It's gold sparkle, whatever that is. Mine, you know? <laughs> chartreuse gold sparkle. Come on. Come on. Why you got to get so fancy with it? Yeah. <laughs> I just got That's this really a couple months ago. I had Because Jake, Jake's like literally five minutes away from me, his shop. Oh, wow. Come on. And, That's so next level. Holy uh, shit. I was definitely going to bring that up because I saw your music video where you're uh, on top of a Jeep playing your gold bass. Uh, I love I love being on top of a Jeep, uh, you know, and <laughs> whether I'm playing a gold bass or not, you know, right. so, you know, fuck it. We ball. But yeah, I mean, I like I like gold. <laughs> I do, too. I like the sparkle. I feel like in the bass world, there's, you know, every bass has this like Myrtle Burl top and this walnut quilted thing. And I, I, there's a place for all that. And I've had a lot of those instruments. But at some point in my life, I was like, I feel like I want a more of a painted bass. I want color. And then I want to stand out. Right. So I feel like. Sure. I put some sparkle on it. So I love that. That's right. the best. I can't believe we're gold twins. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I have a I have a gold base, too. It's just, let's see do? it. Just, it's just uh it's just not here. It's, it's, it's at another it's another, another school. high school. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I have a girlfriend in Canada too, you know. Yeah, totally. Right. <laughs> yeah, man. So I, I love gold and I love the rat pedal. I'm sort of like a like a non purist in any regard, you know what sure. I mean? So like I started I started running my bases through, you know, more traditionally, you know 
guitar effects and that is the you know bass players don't always love the rat because it does cut a bunch of the low end you know theoretically but for me i mean i just like the pr unpredictable nature yeah. of them so much and they're so just like I, I, like if you get it just right it's still a little volatile and i just love that about it and it's just i don't know there's something so kind of raw and fucked up about it and uh so i'm a big i'm a rat guy nice. <laughs> nice. so that's cool and yeah this dude yeah true five pedals guy he just like showed up at my show in portland maine and like hand delivered this to me and i was like what the fuck this is the best thing ever what and it's super sick and the gold base right so the gold base yeah what is, is that built... by the way okay so zeke. well so it's a dude named zeke guitars aka zach but he goes by zeke guitars and and you know a bunch of years ago in like 2019 he just cold reached out to me and was like hey you know, I want to build you your dream bass. What is it? And I was like, uh, well, I love my 78 P bass, but it breaks my back every night. Right. And it's like a little bit off white. Cause of course it's lived a long life and For things sure. have happened. It's like, you know, on, on the edge of cream, let's say, but whatever. Uh, so I was like, I want like my 78 P bass, but lighter, whiter, shorter scale. So like going from a 34 to a 32 right. or something like that. And uh, I want Lindy Fraylins and I want, you know, all the hardware to be gold and yada, yada, yada. And he was like, okay, great, let's do it. And then this dude just builds it. And he he knows me from, uh, he's built a bunch of instruments from the guys in Ween. All right. And Ween, Ween's like my favorite band ever. And, and I'm, and I'm close with those guys or you know you're saying Rowitz. all the right shit right now <laughs> oh good oh good well so uh so anyway dave drywitz the bass player from ween who's like you know one of my biggest mentors and sort of the reason the reason for everything in my life and in a lot of ways sure. uh he drove me down there because of course i am uh, a licenseless new yorker but we went down and we <laughs> went to pennsylvania picked up my first zeke custom bass and it just you know from 2019 till in present day it's just been my ride or die base and then in 2022 zeke was like should we make another one and i was like yes <laughs> gold all gold the same thing but just fucking gold and he did it and it's uh it's really amazing and it's really wild to see how they actually like differ sonically a little bit which yeah. is kind of cool it's a little this one's a little thicker a little meatier a little chunkier i don't know there's something about it whereas the other one is like a little more laid back i don't know i'm, I'm not you know words sure. words fail to describe what these <laughs> things sound like but sure. let me tell you they're both great and i love them both nice. so <laughs> they are my you, children how do you uh so the, the the to compensate for the low end um like squish that you get yeah. out of like the rat pedal how do you compensate for that do you use some sort of blend Oh, I don't, brother. I just wing it, yo. I just I'm out here, you know, using things sporadically, and uh, you know, I hope I I travel with a great front of house engineer who, I I'm hopeful that when I hit my big fuzz bass moments, he does something to compensate for it out front. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of the cop out, shitty, cheap answer, but you know, I <laughs> I click it on, I, and you're just like, this is your problem, sucker. <laughs> I'm like, let's go. It sounds great up here. Come on. I mean, it might sound you know thinner than than I'd like it to on occasion, but also sometimes you know my favorite. I will I'll go on the record as saying I think my favorite bass pedal, and it's not the Deep Impact that's sitting right here which is also Ooh. one of the best bass pedals ever but it's not that it is the tim lafave three leaf audio octave i'm <laughs> yeah. sure you guys know because you are in chicago and you know what the fuck is going on but yeah i i love that pedal so much so on occasion you know i use just one of those channels not the sub like yeah. just like the the octave side yeah. quite a bit and on occasion i'll put that on with the rat Nice. And that really talk about supplementing all of the things yeah. that, you know, get cut out when you just use the rat. Um, but I don't know. I call me crazy. I'm not. It's it's just like, look, this is what this effect is. Maybe it's not doing everything exactly perfectly the way whatever. But like, that's fucking punk rock. Like, right. let's go. Right. Nothing should be perfect. Cobain just plugged right into the rat and had no tuner and. But, right. you know it seemed to work fine for him so I don't know. okay um i'm i'm like i'm a nerd in a lot of ways but i'm not a purist and i'm not a um 
I don't know. I sort of like shoot from the hip and see what happens. Like, I don't think that like everything needs to be perfect or everything needs to be immaculately dialed in or like whatever, like, you know, and also that goes for like songwriting and stuff too. Like, I don't need to be in the best sonically acoustic environment with all the right gear and all the right shit. It's just like, do the best with what you got, you right. know? And, yeah. and that'll also, you know, I, I've been, I'm about to be rich in bass amps, but I have not been rich in <laughs> bass amps. My, like I lit, all I have is an Aguilar 410 yeah. with an AG 700 head. That's all I've ever had, Yeah, you know? And it's like, you know, it's in my studio, then it's on tour and then it's not in my apartment. You know what I mean? So like in my apartment, I have like a really, sh it's not even a bass amp, but like just to practice with, it's like a shitty little guitar amp that like, you know, I'm not afraid to run bass effects and stuff through, but I'm about to have, as Mark knows, a, uh, a Bergantino rig and a Benson mm -hmm. rig. Mm -hmm. so things are going well, things are going well. So I'm excited to have a bass rig in, uh, every room of my apartment and uh, have the pick of the litter as to what comes on the road with me, which is really exciting. You know, when you take the pressure off of like having to be in like the perfect acoustic environment and having the perfect gear, it allows, I've experienced that it allows for like more creativity, more authenticity in, in school and in college, I, I, tuba is my primary instrument. And oh, we had these uh, like, you know, when you're, when you're in, like grade school, high school, you're usually playing on a B flat tuba, B flat concert tuba. In college, they usually have you switch to a C tuba. And, you know, like it's different fingerings, et cetera. And like the, I remember my freshman year, they uh, like they had these like two really nice C horns. I think they were like Parentucci tubas, which is like creme de la creme. And then they had these like just veritable trash cans, essentially. And wow. I like, <laughs> I like, quickly learned that, you know, if I can make this trash can sound good, I, once I get on the other horn, it just does its job for me. And I kind of feel the same way about gear. You get to like make some really unique sounds. You find sort of like this authentic voice with like whatever you've got. And then once you get like the, into like the more like professional grade, so to speak, yeah. gear, then it just makes things a lot easier because you've already like found what you're looking for and it's a little bit easier to get there. Cause like sometimes you, you, you're playing on like this, like these things that can be so temperamental, you know? Certainly. Um, so it's, it's nice to be able to move to something that you can actually find your voice really quickly. I mean, shit, Josh Homme, like he, he was using that, what that PV practice amp. That was like, that was his sound for, for like the early Queens of the stone age records and like totally. the, uh, desert session stuff. So. And that shit sounds fucking amazing, you know? And I feel like you, you hear stories like that a lot in terms of, like, people who are just like, yeah, man, like, we, we just, we figured it out. We It made noise, right? And there are melodies, so, like, we found them, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Out of whatever, out of whatever it was, you know what I mean? It's just, like, it's, uh, to me, it's, you know, gear is so fun, and I've become, like, spoiled, you know, as companies send me stuff, and I'm, you know, I have a lot of friends who are super obsessed with gear and we trade pedals we have like pedal book club almost you know what i mean right. it's like hey here you try this i'll try uh, that oh shit, pedal so fun. book club pedal <laughs> book actual club. idea like uh, that's a really good idea i mean like I you know that, as, yeah. as somebody have, as somebody who works for two like manufacturers i'm probably like shooting myself in the foot <laughs> by saying this but that's a really good idea karina we all love gear we love pedals and stuff but i'm you know as much as like i love all that stuff i try not to be reliant on it and you know plugging straight into something especially like some like a backlined svt like that is just amazing too right. like and then i don't know with my own band of course i have so many pedals and like all this crazy ass shit that is happening so can't really do that <laughs> but on other gigs that's very exciting and fun and you know when i'm on seth meyers i just like plug right in no right. pedals no nothing and i'm like yeah this is great i'm like playing some bass right now okay here we go right. how do you it's feel sad. in those moments when you're playing like just bass pretty raw pretty raw and exposed and uh you know it's 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 more i mean one could argue it's more pure it's not the purest expression of karina but i'm not there to do the purest expression of karina i'm like doing a gig i'm doing a job you know where you're like a part of something way larger than you you know uh yeah for, well tell, me, tell us a little yeah. bit more about the uh, the seth meyers gig. oh the seth meyers gig is so sick you know and i've been i've been lucky i've done it like in a year and 
a half, I guess. I've done it maybe like five or six times, both on guitar and bass, you know, right. but it started out, you know, the bass player is a buddy of mine and he asked if I could uh, fill in because his brother was getting married in Italy or something like that. And I was like, yeah, perfect. So that first one was like premeditated and I like had it on my calendar for a long time. I went in to 30 Rock with him and shouted him for the day and he sh showed me everything and they like write all the music the morning of the show yeah for that day and by right i mean like there's like a whiteboard and everything is either like a commercial walk on song or like a commercial break song or a guest walk on and the yeah. commercial break stuff is like an a section and a b section and then the uh guest walk ons are just like an a section or like a little riff or a little something like that and you record all of it and you can make notes, you can have no, whatever, like by your feet and whatever. And then you, in your in-ears, get a little bit of it sent to you before you play it by the MD to remind you what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So that's a crazy ass, like you're there and the cameras are on and Tracy Morgan's there and everything is like the craziest, like lights, camera, action, showbiz, like just crazy vibe you know and then it's like three two one okay i remember this part okay here we go we're doing it we're we're really doing it and then you have to watch like the stage manager because he gives like a five four three two one kind of vibe and then the drummer like fills to end yeah you know and it's just a super nerve-wracking like the first few times i did it i was scared as shit i was like so <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I'm nervous so and you're intense. just telling me this, telling us right? the story. <laughs> it's intense, man. It was intense. And then of course, like, you know, I started on guitar. I'll admit, I'm sorry, Bass Nerds podcast, but you know, I started on guitar and, and I still play guitar. I write on guitar all the time. I play guitar, you know, in my, in my personal life, but I haven't gigged on guitar really, really in, in quite a minute. You know, I kind of like turned into a bass player, like proper, proper, like maybe eight years ago or something like that. And since then, it's just been bass, 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 you know, and, uh, but I, but, you know, over the course of the last year and a half, I guess, since the first time, you know, when the guitar player has gotten sick or had to be out or whatever, they've called me in to do the guitar parts nice. too, and to fill in on guitar. And, and it's just like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm really terrified now. Like, that's like, you know, you're you just like, like okay. You said there's no like, I mean, they write the cues the day of, so it's not like you can go home and rehearse or practice a thing. You got like a couple hours, right? And then it's like totally. go time, you know? <laughs> and then you show up, yeah, you show up and you're like, okay, cool. So this is what we're going to do for this A section. Great. And then I'm like taking meticulous notes. But you know what's, what's actually I found kind of interesting is, um, which of course a testament to all bass players, it was sort of almost easier to play guitar than yeah. to play bass because with the bass you have to know exactly what note it is right all the time like you could sort of approximate it but kind of know you know what right. i mean like you kind of have to like actually know what the fuck's going on <laughs> sure. whereas on guitar if you just like you know sometimes i would write crib notes to myself and i would just be like you know e major pentatonic yeah rage or whatever, and I would right. know that if I'm like in an E major pentatonic thing and I'm doing like some tasty shit over there, yeah. then it's going to work, you right. know? Right. Yeah, you're not the so, foundation of the track or the sound, right? You're like, it's more ornamental. Or... That's what they say. Yeah, exactly. Did, uh, did, did that experience make you lose respect for guitar players? Absolutely. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, no, I, they I, have I, more respect than the drummers, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, no comment. No, I'm just kidding. I, uh, I, I, I was like, you know, it's, it's a, it's a funny thing. The difference. I feel like it's, um, you know, to, to be like, let's say you're just a real beginner of both, right? It, it takes more time to be up and running as a guitar player than it does to be up and running as a bass player, I would say, you yeah. know, just because you have to like learn chord structures and you have to figure out how to play six strings at the same time and make them sound good in all those ways, you know, but to be a bass player that's like good, good. Right. <laughs> you know, right. and stands out maybe, or like whatever, like that takes, that takes quite a bit. And there's so much pressure in a band setting to like be on point because right. if you're not on point, the yeah. whole thing is completely fucked so you know it's <laughs> I, I feel like you were like going into that like you know as a profession as a bass player to be a pro i could just like sense like the bass mafia of brooklyn 
He's just like guns uh, off camera pointing at you. <laughs> like, what it's you like, gonna well, say? What you gonna say? It's like, Karina, right. say, say playing bass is difficult and valiant. Oh, it, it is. It is, guys. It totally is. <laughs> Don't worry. Stand down, Mafia. They're cool. They're totally cool. Can I get you anything? You guys good? Uh, oh. I, I totally. No, bass is hard, man. Bass is fucking hard. I yeah. Sorry, I, sorry, sorry. I, I totally understand what you're saying because I also, too, started on guitar and was a guitar player for probably close to a decade before I took bass seriously and started playing guitar in like my early. Te I mean, I always had a guitar, but I didn't really take it seriously till maybe like. 12 or 13 something like that and then sure. I played guitar like seriously for almost a decade and you know at 16 was a really good guitar player but um i as i approached like my late teens uh i kind of felt like all right when i was 15 16 i was really good but then once they started reaching my late teens, it's like, there's a lot of really good guitar players out there, you know? And I got yep. to this point where I was like, well, I can continue down the guitar path and which I still play guitar to this day. And like you said, I do a lot of my writing and everything on guitar. Um, but if I want to, you know, my goal was always like play in bands and be able to like play in, you know, exceptional bands. And I felt like if I became a really good bass player i could pick the band i wanted to be in kind of thing uh, sure and there was you know frankly i felt like less competition um and i think like I, th I think there's a little truth to like it may be easier to play bass uh at a mediocre level like yeah bass level right bass bass level right uh but if you want to be like exceptional or really good at or, or considered one of uh, considered a good bass player. Uh oh, I just got a I got a, a time a timer thing here. Hold on. I will, oh, a sweet second. Jesus. No. <laughs> um, and if you want to be a really good bass player, you're going to have to. It's I think it's a lot more difficult than being a really good guitar player, frankly. Um, I would agree. I would agree. Oh. You know, totally. It's just like to get up and running. Right. I feel like if you're if you let let's say you've never touched either instrument, right? And right. you're just like, okay, here we go. All right, it's a one note at a time scenario. Right. You can do this, you can do like I don't know, I feel like I can get if I were to just take a random person off the street who has no musical inclination, I'd be like, "Here, here's a bass. Here's Psycho Killer. You got that?" And that would be that would be easier than me teaching a guitar player seven nation army i don't know why right. i think that but like i do think that that would happen quicker and they would be like okay cool i could just play one note at a time and it would be like maybe passable <laughs> quicker right. somehow but i agree that like to really stand out and to really learn the instrument and to really be like a great bass player is like some fucking that's some shit you know and it's uh people i mean you know there's so many people that i respect so much that have just like you know completely revolutionized revolutionize the instrument obviously and it's uh it's an amazing thing to behold and uh it's cool yeah it's it's fun to play guitar too though you know and it's nice i'm sort of glad that i think all guitar players should know how to play bass and i think all bass players should like know some guitar as otherwise i don't know i think they inform each other in a lot of ways and i think everybody should know how to play the drums a little bit because that's really really the math you know and uh I think maybe everybody should start on drums, then piano, so you can see like what a instrument that's well laid out looks like, you know? Right. <laughs> so that you're like, okay, look, every note that you see, you can see exactly what note you're playing at all times, you know? And then you can give somebody a guitar or a bass and be like, okay, look at this. This is laid out in this really fucked up way. It makes no sense. You're going to have to learn a whole new language. <laughs> and, uh, Good luck, you know. I think it should go in that order. <laughs> that is very, very sound advice. Um, but you know, for the past three minutes, I've just been thinking, like, okay, Jody and Karina are just a couple of fucking posers, right? And, totally. Uh, <laughs> I well, got gold short scale bases, bro. Oh, yeah. bro. I mean, listen, the base mafia is here with their guns, <laughs> and they're gonna kill me after uh, we hang up. So, it's all but good. Uh, you know, like, I guess, what was you said you started playing bass eight years ago? Um, what was the transition like? Like, what kind of got you like really stoked about it well i started i started playing bass you know sort of simultaneously as you know when i was playing guitar when i was you know maybe 
13 or 14. So it's been a long, it's been much longer than eight years that I started playing, you know, for the record, for the record. Um, mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I got this gig that changed the course of my life when I was, uh, you know, 21 or 22 with this guy, Marco Benevento, who oh, yeah. like, you know, Marco took me and that's again, that's because of Dave Drywitz, who was his bass player for the longest time when Ween was disbanded. So Ween like was disbanded between like, you know, 2011 and got back in 2016. And in those years, Dave, the bass player, um, was in Marco's band and toured extensively and blah, blah, blah. And then Ween came back in 2016 and Dave just kind of said like, hey, like I kind of can't keep doing this. And they're also in a Grateful Dead cover band called Joe Russo's Almost Dead that sells mm -hmm. a ton of tickets and you know, tours extensively and all those things uh, and be in Marco's band, you know, like all at the same time. So they basically, you know, he went to Marco and was like, hey, you know, Karina's the only person I want to fill in for me when I can't do your gigs. And he was like, great, I love Karina. Let's give her a shot. But he had never seen me play. This was like purely just based on recommendation, you know. And of course, I have been a huge Marco fan since I was super young, you know, and I'm just like, uh, he's like one of the greatest, most virtuosic piano players, I think ever, you know, so it was right then when I was like, oh, my fucking God, I think I'm a bass player. I need to buckle Thanks. down. Jesus, this is insane. You know, so it was like my senior year of NYU. I was just like, oh, my God, like I have to learn 40 Marco songs in a month right i'm writing my thesis i have a full-time job everything is crazy but like i'm a bass player now you know and i just like committed myself to to you know i i you know tossed all my six strings in the trash just kidding i just put them to the side and i and i uh committed myself to bass then you know and of course you know that i started that whatever that was that summer that spring i started filling in for dave drywitz and marco's band and then by the end of that summer, I was, you know, they like had quote unquote passed the torch and it was my gig, you know? So I've been Marco's bass player for the last like seven, eight years, which is crazy. And I've learned more from him than I, just about anyone. It's really a crazy thing. So he's, you know, to be able to play and also in a trio format, which is amazing, you know? Right. Um, because I don't know, when you play in these power trios or whatever, like, I find that there's a lot of leeway and Marco gives me a lot of leeway to fill up space because he doesn't want it, you know, he wants it to be fun and bombastic and like things happening and whatever. So like, you know, there's sort of no way to overdo it. Sure. I say that with humility because of course there's a way to overdo it. But anyway, right. I try to, I try to make it all, uh, you know, kind of bombastic and fun and you know, I use fuzz in that band too, and all those things, you know, so that's sort of when, when bass became the place for your girl. That's awesome. But when, when, uh, how did you end up meeting Dave? I like, met when Dave when I was like 15 or 16 at like my school of rock program here in Manhattan. I was right. like, you know, he was around, we did like this show with Gene Ween actually, where Gene Ween came and picked a set list for all of us and like sang all these tunes with us and everything. And Dave like came to those rehearsals and just to hang out. And it was super fun. And, you know, I think it was tell me something good by Shaka Khan, like was when Dave saw me play for the first time and we just became Ooh. fast friends, you know? And then I remember I was like 17 or 18. He asked me to play guitar in his power trio, which is called Crescent Moon. And that was a huge honor. Right. for your girl i'll kind of i'll never forget it like i ran into him at a festival that's now defunct called mountain jam up in hunter new york and uh he was like karina you should play guitar in my trio crescent moon and i was like a high school kid i was like what that's amazing you know and uh and we did a bunch of gigs in that uh format which is amazing and they you know he is just an amazing amazing human and an incredible player and just the sweetest person who like literally single-handedly changed my life. Cause before then, like I was in five bands going nowhere. And I say that with a lot of love, but like, you know what I mean? I loved playing, but there wasn't a clear path forward for me to be a performer, you know? And I was not writing my own music at that point at all. I was like a side man in a lot of, you know, with my friends and local bands and this and that and whatever. But, uh, but it wasn't until the Marco gig that like anybody gave a shit about 
you know, right. me or knew about me. Of course not. Like, where would they know me from? <laughs> Skippy's down the block. They don't know about Skippy's <laughs> down the block. It's like, you know, it's a whole other thing. So, um, yeah, that single-handedly changed my life. And, of course, I've just been, like, you know, so endowed and blessed with just, like, you know, the people like that, you know, who have just, like, laid so much crap. Like, they've walked so I can run kind of vibe, you know? And sure. even, I don't know, there's so many amazing mentors in my life, including, like, you know, Trey Anastasio and Mike Gordon from Fish, both in separate ways have just been so incredible with me and you know trey produced my album and plays on five of the nine songs and mike is a super dear friend and you know invited me to sound check with the band at madison square garden in 2018 and it's... that video sort of had a semi-viral moment in its own weird way and yeah i don't know we just are super like you know uh we're we're base pals on a whole other thing so i don't know to have people like that in your life that are you know between dave and marco and mike and trey and I, the list goes on, you know, but, you know, people who are older than you have been doing it forever and who have just such a su incredible musical sense and just like a, a life sense, you know what I mean? They really can give you a lot of perspective on the business and creativity and what it all means and like, you know, being a solo artist, being in a band, this and that, like, it's pretty crazy. So I've been insanely blessed in this regard. So uh, when you were 15, um you, you're at School of Rock. Where, did you already have a lot of interest in, uh, in like like the sort of jam repertoire, or was that like just sort of like introduced to you once you met Gene Ween and and Dave? <laughs> no, I already I was I was deep in it already. I played a lot of metal. I played a lot of punk. I played a lot of you know just thick '70s riff rock. You know, at that yeah, like I was really into. Black Sabbath and Aerosmith and Humble Pie and I don't know, James Gang and all kinds of, you know, just nice. the usual, the usual suspects, you know, but I was also really, really into fish, like really into fish, you know, and really into the Almond Brothers band where like in March, the Almonds would come to the Beacon Theater, which yeah. is just, you know, just a few blocks from where I grew up. And I every March you know, saw all 10 shows for many years there as like a high school student. Of course, this was completely anachronistic and I had nobody my age who was also into this shit. Right. So that's a whole other problem. But uh, that's I not true. I was in the exact same boat Dude, in high school. Crazy. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. You know, I, I, it's that's, you know, a little bit of a lie. I had several very good friends my age with whom you know we would all go but i was Found very, your little core you know, group right yeah. i had my little core group which was nice but also you know i'm an only child they say we peer with adults they say you know <laughs> i'm an old soul i don't know i uh, had many many old friends and made many old friends doing all that and seeing music right. that appealed to people who aren't 13 right theoretically you know um but yeah no i was really into the jam stuff uh you know and i you know both, I don't know, I, I've always felt like both are amazing. I, I, I feel like they influence each other in my playing. Like when I listen to a guy like Dave Schools or something from Widespread Panic or Phil Lesh or Mike Gordon or any of these like jam band bass players, a lot of whom, by the way, play with picks and stuff. That's like a very like a jam band kind of thing, you know, to play like a five or six string <laughs> modulus or whatever with with a pick. Right. And then you look at Geezer Butler or Cliff Burton or any of those guys that like, I don't know, there's there are things that are intrinsically linked, of course, because it's music. Right. And like, I think, uh, you know, jam band's not a, a four letter word in my in my brain. I think it's super cool. And I think like, you know, to have both of those influences growing up and seeing that now I'm sort of you know, I find like my music pretty hard to categorize because it's super eclectic and one song sounds like this and then the next one sounds like this. And, you know, sometimes it's funky and dancey and sometimes it's super heavy and sometimes it's just like a psychedelic pop song or whatever it is. You know, I uh, I think all of it has just kind of influenced me in so many ways. And I don't think that they're geometrically opposed man i think it's all good in my head <laughs> but of course if you go to the metal guys they're like wait what what's that about and you go to the jam band guys they're like yeah i love metal so that's sort of <laughs> where i stand oh the, i i have uh, i have fought that for for many years you know when i first moved to chicago i was just really getting into like heavier music but i'd grown up listening to 
all the same things that you're saying, like a lot of dead, a lot of fish, a lot of string cheese, all those, all those jam bands. And then I sure. made the decision to move to Chicago and I just started getting it. I saw like the documentary American hardcore. Sure. And I was like, Oh, my oh God, yeah. I'm about this, this, this sound, this seems more like me. Got a bright orange Mohawk and <laughs> sort of like had to like pretend that I, like, I don't know. Like I just like felt this pressure to not expose myself as being into jam bands. It was like this weird taboo with this new scene that I was kind of like making friends with. And then it was so funny, like about maybe 15 years ago, uh, I was talking with a buddy of mine. He's like a local amazing musician. His, his name's Bruce Lamont. And we were talking about um, like the dead and he just starts going off about like all these shows that he loves. And we start talking about Barton Hall and all that shit. And, and I was like, you're, you're a real deadhead too. And he's just like, yeah, yeah. Like, it's like this like secret society of like these like metal like these these heshers here in chicago totally. who are like massive deadheads so we were even like talking like we had this like group text of like you know these guys who are in just like massive touring like heavy bands yeah and we're, we're all deadheads it's like let's let's start like a a, a dead cover band <laughs> just do like do that <laughs> but best. like yeah and um i just you know i i found that the uh the jam scene is a lot more they're, the tastes are much more eclectic, as you said, like there's, you, you can find, it's it's interesting. It's like when people, when, when your average person hears the term jam band, they yeah. just immediately think of just like noodling on one chord for 25 minutes. And it's, it's a lot more than that, you know? Sure. I think that's why I've found myself embraced by that world is because, you know, if I get jazzy, they're there. If I get heavy, they're there. If I'm, you know, if they can dance to it, they're there. Like they're just such a, they have super kind of open ears just as such, you know what I mean? Like the jam band community, which is a really kind of beautiful thing, you know? Yeah. And I love improvisation. Improvisation is fucking sick. Improvisation to me is freedom and all I want in my music is freedom. You know what I mean? And of course, like I find freedom in a three chord punk song as well. You know what sure. I mean? When I listen to Attitude by the Bad Brains, that's freedom, but so is, you know, a 40 minute dark star, like all of that. Mm -hmm. And that to me, those things shouldn't be in competition with each other. They're the same thing to me. And Attitude by the Bad Brains is like barely a minute long, right? So like, I, I, I think those things are really, you know, if we could all just embrace both, man, it's all music. I was having this great chat actually, you know, with um, the guys in Clutch, like they're super open. Like, you know, we talk about Wayne Shorter and Sepultura in the same sentence. And like, yeah. that's cool as fucking hell. Like, I'm like, yes, I found my people. Let's talk, let's go, you know? And like- They, they had that like instrumental side project, right? The Bakerton group with yeah. the B3. Oh man, that was sick. Like, it's super fucking sick. Like, JP the drummer is such a, like, musical guy, you know? And Neil Fallon is, too. like, they're, like, super cool. We got to hang out a bunch at uh, Christmas Jam, Warren Haynes's, like, big charity event uh, down in Asheville where we all played this crazy arena, you know? And it was yeah. super fun to hang with a bunch of bands and incredible artists that, like, you know, I didn't fully know. I mean, I've been a big Clutch fan since I was, you know, about 13 years old, but, like, we weren't pals Right. You know, and we got to hang out a bunch and it's just cool to hear people in, you know, I don't know, being genre fluid is fucking cool, man. I think it's uh, it's an awesome thing. And, you know, if you're open, even if you do one very distilled thing, it's going to inform that one distilled thing and make it so much more interesting than if you just were super close minded and only listened to, you know, one style or some shit like that. I don't know. But I'm with you, the American hardcore thing. I'm I'm all that's that's big for me too. And I'm, you know, I I even like the next one, like I love sick of all sick of it all. I love the Cro-Mags. Yeah. I love Agnostic Front. I love, you know, even Murphy's Law. Like a lot of this New York hardcore stuff is huge for me in a, in another way, you know, and that's really cool too. And it's, you know, it I wish that you could just kind of, you know, be like, hey, what's up, man? Like, yeah, let's talk Agnostic Front and then let's talk Allman Brothers. Like, <laughs> but people are like, wait, what? What are you talking about? But anyway, to me, all it's right. all music. Music. New is York cool. Hardcore, Crow Mags, Harley yeah. or Joseph? Joe. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a. It, you Tread know, lightly. <laughs> yeah. One I, of them will stab you. <laughs> One will stab you. The other uh, moved to Florida because uh, he's an anti-vaxxer. But, you know, that's, 
all good. He's also, you know, an old school pal. Um, so I love you, John Joseph. How are you? Great. To yeah. Hear from. Oh, I, I loved listening yeah. to uh, his his podcast for for a minute there. That was oh, yeah. that was a lot of fun. There was a lot of good stuff, uh, and he had the audio book too. I like, Evolution of a Crow Magnon and Meat is for yeah. Pussies. Those are great. Like you yeah. know, he he's written great books, and he's an inspiring yeah. guy. I wish he, I, you know. He literally just, fled just, New York because he didn't agree with the politics. But I'm like, wow, all right, all right. Cool. There's That's there's just cool. something really like wonderful about hearing the content he's talking about, about being a very spiritual person, but hearing it the way he talks with like the thick, mean, mean streets of New York accent. It's just, totally. it's just oh, so it's funny. The best. Yeah. Like I just just hearing like, yeah, I don't know. I I, I that was the, that was half the entertainment uh of of that. But yeah, that's it's just great. He's super entertaining. He's, you know, let's, let's, he's a character, just like Vinny Stigma is a character and, and all those things. Oh, you know who's a real, a dear friend of mine who's also an incredibly open person in the world of punk and hardcore is Toby Morse from H2O. Do you know this band? You know this guy? He's the mm -hmm. fucking best. He has a podcast too that I'm appearing on at the end of the month, but <laughs> he's, uh, he's a great dude and he, like, you know, he's literally tatted up from his like head to his toes and like, you know, he sings in a hardcore band and stuff, but like he loves Coldplay and he's not afraid to admit it. And he has like Robert Smith from The Cure on tattooed on one ass, che ass cheek and uh, Prince on the other ass cheek, you know? And it's just like, that's my fucking dude right there. I love Toby Morse, shout out Toby Morse. You're the fucking man. I love, you know, it's like, that's, that warms my heart. What a yeah, I, I used to get a lot of flack from, well, from a, a, a lot of different being a musician and uh you know my early guitar days was like absorbing as much different styles and music as i possibly could so i would go through like bluegrass phases and then i would go through like shout gospel music phases the fred yeah. Edmonds and perk franklin's of the world and then i would go through like i had a disco phase where i was like just like the Bee Gees and all these like you know kind of cory wong kind of guitar riffy kind of things and then motown soul and then i remember like in my early 20s i was a bricklayer in construction and one of the coworkers asked me, he like found out I was a musician and then asked me if I liked Prince. And I was like, and I was just like, oh my God, let me tell you how much I love Prince, right? <laughs> and he made fun Do you of have me an hour? so bad. But I thought he was like a, a friendly, like, I like Prince too. And he was like, no, he just kept calling me Raspberry Beret the whole time. Oh, shit. <laughs> and just every day would make fun of me for liking Prince. But I never backed down. And I was like, no, you're wrong in this scenario. Prince is a god. You are wrong. And I never was like, oh, I guess you're right. No, 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 no. no, I always stood my ground. But it was always like, I definitely would get like, and then I was like, I would go play guitar in like, and there's no nicer, easier way to say it, but like black churches where I was the only white guy there. But I just like was so moved by like shout music and that it, the and it, everybody was very accepting and warm and welcoming and uh, all that stuff. Not that I was necessarily like a devout Christian by any sense, but uh, I just really enjoyed the energy and the musicianship of that music. And I'm sure we've all seen the Kirk Franklin Tiny Desk. And if you haven't, I'm oh, yeah. people to go watch that. Mm. It is I've got incredible. Brighter Day on repeat, my guy. Brighter Day. Like, <laughs> right. brighter, that shit is so good and crazy. I literally, that's that's in my ears. Like, like that's like on repeat for me right now yeah you know? like i don't know why but fuck yeah yes yeah so i i feel you with the like different genres of music and then like when i was a kid my father owned a like a very small mom and pop music store so people would wow. come in from and just play guitar from every i mean people were playing guitar with like pennies like as picks to people who were playing like weird jazz stuff to people who were playing whatever you know and i was a big metalhead for a long time and metallica and stuff like that uh that was a probably like the constant through like my teens was like metal music um but then i had sure. always these like phases where i got into like just weird stuff for six months or a year at a time like soup i would just go on these like really deep dives and this is like early days of like 
good internet you know like sure. it wasn't like dark web internet it was like early 2000s you could download napster tracks and it would take eight hours to download eight lars songs. was right, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> he's and... here man he's gonna sue you dude he's he's, he's coming out napster well, police listen it, if, it, honestly i always bought all my metallica stuff i had like the box sets and stuff like that uh sure i did sure buy did. all my metallica yeah. stuff but uh there would be like things that were also hard to find at record stores uh like a lot of bluegrass stuff that you just couldn't find at circuit city or best buy or whatever at the time sure um so yeah i would and then like discovering like now with like youtube you can discover everybody and see all these super talented musicians bass players and stuff like that but i still remember the first time i on a whim i bought a bela fleck dvd and oh, yeah. it changed my life you know seeing live art uh, was it live art it was uh live at the quick yeah that yeah. one where they start with uh the the dude with the with the, the there's a bassoon bassoon, bassoon player cool. but the fr- that's a fun thing to stumble upon that's a real fun thing to stumble upon that's so cool i was playing i like had met this guy through uh a bass player actually through um like one of the gospel churches i was playing at and he was like a really he this was before i played bass and he played bass at a level of like exceptional right and i was like man this guy plays bass better than anyone i know whatever da, da, da. and he was like victor wooten victor wooten i'm like victor who the victor what you know like had no idea who this guy was right and i was one of those people who if i hadn't 20 bucks in my pocket i was like my thing was buying like live concert dvds so i would go to wow. best buy or circuit city or whatever local thing and i would just peruse until i found something that i was like all right you know bonnaroo box set or whatever i could and i remember i the, frankly if i'm being honest the reason i bought the fleck tones like i saw it was victor wooten and i was like i don't know i don't know but it was on sale. It was like every DVD oh, was 20 bucks and this one was like 14 or something like that. And I came in hard and I was like, all right, I'm just, because I also at that time, and I'm sure Mark could attest, like sometimes you would buy a CD or an album or a DVD and you'd be disappointed. You'd mm-hmm. like buy it for the like one song you heard. You're like, oh man, this song's great. And then you listen to the rest of the album and 80% of it was like, you know, you weren't, weren't into. Um, right. And so... I was like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't big on buying stuff that I was unfamiliar with, you know? So with this buddy's recommendation and it was on sale, I was like, all right. And I went home and I put it in and it was one of those moments, like I can still picture sitting on the couch, watching the first song. Like the first song starts with Victor Wooten by himself. And, um, and he's like playing what seems like a simple riff that I still to this day have not mastered. Uh, and I've got scratch clip. and sniff. I don't remember the name. Bow, of the bow, 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 no, bow. no, no. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that one starts it, and it, the song he like starts the track, and I want to say he's off stage, and you just hear it, and then he walks out, and he's just so casually playing it, and I'm over here like. I watched it probably three or four times within the first 24 hours, like the whole DVD. I was like, I, and then, you know, the bassoon guy comes out and the throat singing guy comes out and Bela Fleck with a, a future man playing a drumatar. And then like, there's just so yes. many aspects yes. that just like blew my mind um, that, uh, but it was all for this like uh, experimentation in music, you know, like trying hearing different genres and you know taking bits and pieces of it and i think that's you know probably what makes you the bass player you are today because you've got a little bit of that metal a little bit of that hardcore thing a little bit of you know a little bit of everything makes you the musician you are today and i still to this day like you know take when i play guitar i'm stealing like george benson riffs and metallica mixing them with metallica riffs mixing them with all kinds of you know fun stuff to like create my own sound so um and then i also like i know you had mentioned um like jam band scene like being very accepting and i think it's important to point out like we recently did a podcast with um john ferrara of consider the source and if you're unfamiliar he does there consider the source is like this psychedelic jazz 
space oddity of virtuosity, right? The guitar player's oh, yeah. got a double neck guitar, one's fretless and what the other's not, but the, a lot of tapping bass stuff and like really kind of out there instrumental music but he was like you know we found our home in the jam band scene where these people who were like we're not really a jam band at all you know but it was like people could appreciate the musicianship and then we started playing and we got we like got this one jam band fest and when we early on and then all of a sudden like people started following us and then we started doing so like they're i think like their bread and butter now is really doing a lot of these jam band fest um because that uh community is very open and accepting and certainly they have like you know 10 minute songs that are jams and like prog kind of rock thing um sure but uh you know i, I don't think all scenes like, like you know even mark was like uh, uh hardcore this or that you know like they're everybody's got a little bit of uh yeah like there's a tendency for folks to yuck others yum yeah you know and yeah. and like i found those people just to not be really worth my time sure. <laughs> anymore Amen. like the, you, right like you end up forging relationships and connections with people who like are open to other ideas it's just my i, I guess a good uh, a good like litmus test would be like do you uh do you listen to screwdriver <laughs> no okay cool then you're probably all right like i don't give a shit what you listen to and that's how it should be if it strikes a chord you should enjoy it and for a long time i had this like sort of like bug in my ear uh with like a couple friends who like were in the like into the jam band scene got out and they're like oh the scene is so uh elitist and stuff and i kind of like allowed myself to think that but then like you know later in in where i am in my career now being introduced to folks like you ryan stasic people like 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 mike gordon admiring these people for so long and then just sort of getting out of the scene and then be like rekindling that sort of uh relationship and and uh interest i realized i was totally wrong these people like the people like the naysayers <laughs> like the people who were like shit talking this whole time were absolutely incorrect <laughs> and like yeah you're always going to find a, a subset of all groups right i mean i'm sure there's like haters when it comes to john mayer and dead and company right there's like oh, yeah. purist totally. or whatever but i think in general like those guys are still selling out arenas and are, are you are you finding any obstacles in the scene arena i mean you know it, it's there's there's a part of you that's sort of like you know you're in the scene and you're not like i'm not a two-set band you know what i mean i'm not delivering a completely new show every single night you know because yeah. i don't have the material quite yet so it's just like okay like maybe i'm ensconced in this scene and and sometimes i i hope that i'm not letting the fans down by falling short in terms of what they think i should be as opposed right. to what i want to present i want to present a 90 minute to two hour bombastic rock show one set you know what i mean that's like you know it's it's not the typical jam band model where we all just stand there in our little positions with in-ears and just like make incredible music by just like stand you know what i mean like i'm running around the stage i'm doing this i'm doing that it's like a whole other thing so i think that's more of just like a mental you know that's not a real obstacle i don't think i just i just hope that i'm not delivering something or like I hope that I'm not falling short to these people who are fans of this type of music, who are used to a certain kind of two set show with no opener that, you know, is different every single night and blah, blah, blah. And like, by the way, like, that's a really, that's something that I strive to, to do, you know what I mean? But I'm so like my band's so in its infancy and, you know, we just put out our first record that like, you know, I don't have the material to make it completely new every single night yet, right. you know, but that's something that the jam scene definitely I think making your shows specific and like, you know what I mean? And never doing things the exact same way twice. That is something that I definitely want to do sure. and do in my own ways for sure. And we add in little covers and we do things differently and nothing's ever played the same way twice. Exactly. But you know, uh, yeah, those, I, I think those things are, are, you know, taking the good from all of these kind of, different worlds of music is really cool and i think like that's one thing that you know the jam scene is doing right in so many ways is making these shows these sort of 
moments in time that you you're either there or you're not and like maybe you know we record the show maybe we put the show out etc cetera, etc cetera. that's a dissemination of the tapes and nugs.net and all these places where people you know Bandcamp, whatever people like will download your live shows and stuff and yeah. they get disseminated that way and that's a super super cool way of of sharing music and stuff but uh yeah i don't know i don't know other than that you know obstacle wise I, that and that's that's just a total mental thing. I'm what that's like me sitting here just wondering like, am I falling short in that regard? But like, I'm putting on a different sort of show, you know, which is much more akin to sort of a more normal or traditional rock show. You know what I mean? In terms of what people you know are used to, or, or even like I don't know if you go see. <laughs> Basically anything but a two set jam band. That's sort of what I'm put, right. putting out there. You know what I mean? But uh, but with a ton of jam influence as well, and plenty of improvisation and stuff like that going on as well. So I don't know. It's hard to say, Mark. It's hard to say. It's well, hard to say. Well, see, seeing the footage of of you playing, like it's 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 a party that like it just seems like it's a party that everybody's invited to, and it's there's a lot of like really positive energy on stage, and like people were i think people as a whole respond to authenticity and like whether or not you're playing different you know the set like two different sets each night um it, like it doesn't really seem to matter as long as the energy is positive everyone's welcome um and like there is a degree of there's like a high degree of musicianship that's there i think those are the important ingredients like Jody had mentioned bailiff like in the fleck tones how many how many festivals like jam festivals have you seen with like hit them on the bill or like dave matthews band on the bill you know um bands that have like clear a, a set you know right. maybe they dip into some sort of improvisation but for the most part they have like they'll they'll play the next festival you know two days later or a week later and it's the same set but sure. it's it's still the appreciation for the higher caliber of musician is that what you're finding as well I would certainly think so. Yeah, definitely. I think they have a, you know, that's that's sort of there's a big emphasis on on that. And I think the way you put like, you know, a party that everyone's invited to, that's like that's all I want from this life is to be if I can like provide that and people come to that and like I have a small part in providing people, you know, two hours of relief from, you know, the horrors of 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 life, you know, in my little bubble of the Karina show like that's incredible you know and that's sort of that you know that makes it all worth it if that's what people are getting from my live music experience you know and whatever and I I I mean I felt that way for so 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 long just being a rabid fan of live music and going to see my favorite artists and just being kind of you know swaddled by you know it's just music you know what I mean it's just it's it's rhythm it's heartbeat it's just like you forget about everything else going on in your life for just a little bit of time and I think that's so important and like that's sort of you know the the best most healing sort of thing that we can offer this world as musicians it's an amazing amazing thing that like you know stresses and other preoccupations and you know what's going on in the world it just melts away for a hot second and you can just be with everybody in the room regardless of what they look like, age, race, orientation, all of it, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's just, I think, invaluable. And that's why live music, you know, I, I, it, it'll never go away. People like that communal experience with other music fans. Like it's what, you know, whether it, you know, the landscape's changing, things, you know, things look different than they used to, et cetera, et cetera. But there's something so special about playing live. And I've always, I've been a live I'm a road dog, you know what I mean? I'm not a studio rat. Like this is all, it's all about the live thing for me, which is another reason I think I've been sort of, you know, swaddled by the jam band scene in a great way because it's all about the live show. And it's like, were you there? How many shows have you seen? I've seen 143 fish shows. Oh, I've seen 278. Nice, man. When was your first show? Like all about the show, all about the thing. And of course, you know, that sort of intangible magic that you can only hope to create, you know, and, and, sometimes it falls short sometimes that show wasn't as good as the last one like that's just a such a cool element of all of it that i don't know i'm i'm super proud to be a part of it in any small way it's yeah. really cool um i want to definitely touch on that you had mentioned i mean like your long history of like 
kind of being a side player with Marco, with Seth Meyers, all that. But then you have recently released an album and kind of wanted to see, like, well, how did that path happen? Interested in, like, understanding the process and the recording process, producers, you know, the whole thing. And you said Trey's on the album. Uh, so, like, how what made you decide to to do your own album? Oh, man. I mean, it's it's just all sort of preceded by its own design, sort of accidentally and naturally in so many ways. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I started jamming with Adam and Chris. It's my guitar player and my drummer in like 2017 because I had actually booked this gig at a festival in New Jersey. Like this festival reached out to me and they, you know, gave me a budget and they were like, Karina, we want you to curate your own super jam. Nice. Call your friends, curate it figure it out and I was like okay sounds good and I got John Medeski Billy Martin Marco Benevento and Nels Klein and wow. me that was my band and I was like you know super young and like those are my heroes and also people I knew and 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 whatever but I was just like holy shit they all went for it oh yeah. my god now I gotta start practicing like you know <laughs> <Whoops>. I, mean? <laughs> I was like holy shit this is so daunting actually wow what was I thinking just kidding I was super stoked but that was uh that was insane. And basically to prepare for that, me and my two NYU buddies, Adam and Chris, like we would get together and I was like, guys, can we practice improvising like a lot? And they were like, yeah, sounds good. So we would just get in Adam's Brooklyn bedroom, yeah. which had a full drum kit and amps and everything. And we would just jam and jam and jam with no time nor space, you know, yeah, just flow. agenda. Like it was just like, let's just, we're just there in the moment creating for the purpose of it feeling good and me practicing to shed with my heroes and all that stuff. But that all of a sudden, like, you know, it was sort of, that was the second year that I was in Marco's band, you know what I mean? So people were yeah. sort of, they started to know who I was and, and throwing things my way and being like, Hey, Karina, we're doing a benefit concert. Can you put something together? Yeah for it or whatever so our first gig was uh you know a few days before 2018 it was like you know late yeah. december 2017 and it was just me and my two buddies from nyu improvising yeah. for like an hour you know and whatever it was and it was not you know not an a section not a b section not a jumping off point not a cover nothing it was pure improv like yeah kind of as pure as it gets and then we did that all throughout 2018 and it just kind of like got a bunch of traction for no reason i mean i i think it was good and people were taping it and people were disseminating the tapes and saying that it was cool and blah 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 and then sort of come to you know 2019 i was like guys i think maybe we should uh write some songs here you know nice and uh and then next thing you knew you know like it's like already you know at that point we played a bunch of these improv gigs and done a bunch of stuff but like you know that you know june 2019 we got booked to open for Krung Bin at the Capitol Theater, yeah, you know, one of my nice. favorite bands. I was like, and then we were playing Mo Down, the Mo Festival. We were playing Huluween. I was like, how on earth <laughs> is all of this happening without a piece of recorded music to my name? Like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, talk about just like so much goodwill and all this stuff from from the world and from the community that I was just like, all right, Karina, time to buckle down. You're a fucking songwriter now. Like, get your shit together. You know. Right. So my first song. It's called Plants. It's an instrumental. Came out like four days before we opened for Krungbin at the Cap because I was my big uh, like, I had a big hang up about that in terms yeah. of I was just like, dude, like, all these things are falling into your lap. Like, you have to make good on this. You know what I mean? Like, you yeah. can't do this without a song to your name. Like, it's time to start. The time is now. You know? Right? No, I agree. So, totally. Yes. My first two songs came out in 2019 and it was and the second one was elevator which is now you know both of those songs are still just super staples of the live set and and have taken on amazing lives of their own um in the live context and whatnot but then yeah i mean 2020 comes and then boom you're shot down by the pandemic but kind of i don't know my band was just like in the right moment such that I, we actually had all these kind of pandemic gigs where all like in the hamptons and in like New Jersey and Vermont and all these things like people were like reaching out to me just being like, hey, we'll pay you X amount if, if you want to come play our backyard or on our beach or on our, you know, yeah. lake or whatever. And we were like, cool, perfect. So like my band actually played quite a bit throughout the summer of 2020, which is amazing. Yeah. And we're super grateful. And uh, we recorded two tunes and put two tunes out that year. And then 
2021 comes around and it's like we suddenly have agents right. and manager like all things are just happen because before that there was no agent no manager blah 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 and then just little by little things sort of started to develop and i was writing more i was putting out like two i was like i referred to myself as six singles reichman until my album <laughs> came out last <laughs> September. I was like, I'm just six singles Reichman out here. I put out two singles a year from 2019, 2020, 2021. And then I, I, you know, withheld the floodgates in a big way because I was like, all right, time for a larger body of work. And it was right in the summer of 2021 that I ran into Trey Anastasio at a festival who we, you know, we had known each other for a long time, but he was just like, he ran up to me and was so excited about my original music. And he started, oh. he mentioned every one of my songs to me by name and was like, we listen to city kids around the house all the time and blah, blah, blah. And he was just super excited and whatever. And, and, you know, started just laying down on me, like how important, you know, to push the art form forward, like original music, especially in the scene is so necessary because people are so, you know, there are a hundred and, that there are how many Grateful Dead cover bands are there, right? Like, which is all good. You can be a Grateful Dead cover band. It's all good. But in terms of pushing things forward and continuing the, you know, yeah, everything, he was just so obsessed with original music, you know, and he wanted to help in that moment. You know, we had a lot of conversations and I told him I was, you know, working on my debut record and he was like, oh shit, you know, got super excited and one thing led to another and he offered me the barn which is where you know his recording studio up in vermont and he was like and we'll get bryce goggin to mix it and i was like what and he was like and i can play on it and he was i was like what and you know he like reharmonized a lot of choruses and like you know he's yeah. like the he just got so into it and and all and i just you know i could never thank him enough for literally right. everything you know he's given me everything so anyway that's the long winded story about how that all happened, but it's just been an incremental, completely proceeding by its own design. Oh, Karina, you're given this opportunity. All right, well, shit, uh, let's do it. You know, it's yeah. like, okay, well, you don't have any songs. All right, we'll write them, you know, <laughs> like that sort of thing. Oh, I got to press something. Hold on. Got it. It was on my telephone. We're killing it. It was, you know. If I'm recording in two separate places, guys. Um, <laughs> anyway, all of that, all of that has just been insane. And then, of course, like this last year, like, what can you even say? Like, I've had this record come out. i have headlining the country and playing to ravenous fans and incredible audiences and, you know, just continuing. And now I'm writing my second LP and super deep in that process. And it's just like everything has just been supernatural and unforced. If you, you know what I mean? It's right. just like this has all been it's like when your path is shown to you you right. like you're creating it by doing it but like the world is creating it by doing it with you when you well responding it, to it you know? right so like yeah. you know you put the stuff out there it starts to get some traction and like you said you're getting you were getting these gigs and these offers even though you didn't really you didn't have a body of work behind you but it was just be, you know like You've you've given a lot of praise to, um, you know, the people who've come before you and who have walked the path right um, to create a path for for musicians like you. Um, but you also have to take some credit for yourself that like people are doing that because they're responding to your hard work as well. Right. Um, and you create the thing and then you just see what sticks and you go with that and you keep building with that and then you know you were the side player for a long time and then it was like well now i gotta i'm doing these gigs myself so now i gotta put some singles out there and then you were six six singles karina for a while <laughs> and it was like i gotta put this album out and then what's the next logical step is like to tour that album and then continue to create new music and and stuff like that when i look at like um like I'm, I'm looking at your Spotify now. I see that like Plants is well over a million listens and streams, and Elevator is a little bit, is well over half a million streams. Is that like all kind of like organic, or was there like a TikTok that picked up your song, or like can you point organic. to a thing that was like this made my song over the course of three months? I got you know whatever half a million streams or something like that. Right. I mean, I wish, man, I wish there was yeah. something, you know, sort of uh, specific in that regard. I mean, you know, al the algorithm is a very uh, 
you know, <laughs> it's a right. crazy thing, you know, and I think plants just got picked up early because it was sort of this very groovy instrumental that like, you know, I don't like to think that I'm making background music, but I think that plants sure. sort of got placed into a lot of just like groovy instrumentals sort Plays of list not kind of not like actual spotify playlists okay. like not you know which sure. would be i've so i've never been on an actual spotify playlist but like okay. in a lot of discover weeklies and yeah. in a lot of like if you look at the like it's just regular people's playlists yeah. but they're all like groovy instrumentals but that, i know? feel like that's what you want right like you know, like it's like um, healthy growth, right? Like it's sure. like manageable growth, right? Like all of a sudden, you know, if you were on a Spotify playlist and all of a sudden you're at, you know, whatever, 10 million streams, like, okay, we would all love to see that, right? But like sure. you've got 1.3 million streams on plants on Spotify alone, like, and if it's natural and it's really like word of mouth and people sharing stuff and getting new fan, you know, uh, 10 new fans, every gig that's like harding your, your track or whatever, like those right. are people who you are like kind of the diehards, right. Who really appreciate your music. And it's not just by happenstance that like everybody follows their Spotify playlist and have curated playlists through Spotify and you're getting these streams. Uh, and that's nice. But if people are actually like seeking you out, I think sure. it's like really where you want to be, right? Uh, it's sustainable. Yeah. It's a, yeah, well, it's a beautiful fan. I believe in that. I believe in the person to person direct, like, you know, one fan at a time thing. That's why you tour. That's why I run to the right. merch booth immediately after I'm done playing and sell everything myself. Like, that's right. why I meet people. That's why, like, you know, I don't know. I, I appreciate when artists that I love do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they care about their fans and they care about, you know, I hope to never get big enough to stop doing that. You know what right. I mean? Because it's important to me. And that's like, I don't know. That's something that is, uh, I, I think, invaluable in a lot of ways in creating sort of these special moments for people and just all, all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, I never thought I'd be an artist that streamed well. Yeah. You know, I was very surprised when Plants sort of was just like the first thing that I did. And I was like, oh, wow, like right. Plants is going to have a million streams on it. That's kind of crazy. Like I never, never saw that coming. And it's still it's not, you know, I, I think uh, we'll certainly sell a million tickets before we sell a million records. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like, sure. It's more it's <laughs> more of that sort of vibe, uh, which I'm you know, I wouldn't have it any other way is what I'm trying to say. I think I think you're totally right. And it's, you know, our viral moments. Awesome totally uh okay. but like i haven't had any when it comes to my music i had one viral moment over the summer it was about a rush shirt that oh i, was I saw i saw your rush yeah that yeah. was like and that i got a bunch of followers from that but it's right. all people with the name like uh you know working man 2112 and like <laughs> you know which is cool i'm super here for that but like you know are they diehard karina fans i don't know maybe they are now but like right. you know they didn't come about this uh in a in the most organic way but yeah i don't know it's interesting P like bands that like are out here just crossing their fingers for a viral moment and making you know right. flashy content and stuff which is totally cool i think that's awesome and like i like flashy content i fucking love that sure. stuff but sure. like you know uh, the people that you accrue through that i mean i hope they stick around i don't know yeah it just seems know. like it just seems like they're setting themselves up for disappointment you know well, it could be that but like i think it's it's also important like like uh a person like you, Karina, where you're like building this foundation, right? Where you have now you have a website, a tour, music, videos, all these things. So like when you create sure. that, you know, you stumble upon that rush viral TikTok thing, like people now are like, who is this person? And now you've got you've set yourself up for success where they're like, sure. oh, they're doing this music. Let me listen to that. And uh, let me heart this. And there's like this thing like if you had, you know, that that TikTok could have been you know, frankly, made by any, uh, you know, person who was like, I was confronted about my rush shirt and then I put this person in their place, but right. they, they didn't need to be a musician. They didn't need to be all these things. And then that thing would have just died. Right. And it would have been this like 15 seconds of fame. Right. And then that would have sure. been it. But now people see that and they go like, who the fuck is this? And she's a musician. She plays bass, Seth Meyers. What the fuck's going on? You know? And then they're like, 
following and oh this person's got a million streams on this their, their track their plants track like i guess i gotta listen to that for 30 seconds to see if i like it you know and then sure. they become your your fan and you get all these additional followers and you get these people and hopefully it turn, translates into ticket sales album sales all that stuff um so i think you it, i think there's something to be said for like setting yourself up for success so like if you just plan on those viral moments they're not really gonna go anywhere very far but if you've set this foundation and you've built this persona or this like your presence online that can snowball into something greater that's right? really true that's really true and it's uh, you know it, who am i to say, like you know people stumble upon all kinds of things in all kinds of ways and and it, you know if it appeals to them it does and if it doesn't you know what i mean like who's to say who's to right. say what the right or wrong way to make a fan is like i don't sure. know right i have no idea right <laughs> And but you really God don't really, care as long as they become fans, right? Like, I mean, however, you know. however they find out about you is cool, right? I, I mean, I've stumbled upon tons of artists in really bizarre ways over the, you know, in the past, and yeah. one isn't worse or better than the other. I would say you're right. So, right. there you have it. And so now you're pushing, you're touring the U.S. right now, right? Or coming up very soon? I know you're coming to Shuba's in Chicago. Played there many times. Correct. Looking forward to that for sure. Oh, yeah. thanks, guys. I'm super stoked. I'm super stoked. We have like we've got a we've like, got a crew. We've got a crew coming. Oh, that'll be really fun. I'm very excited to see you guys there. <laughs> that'll be great. Yeah, that's the uh, you know in mid February we take off on like you know all the parts of the country that we haven't hit yet on the Joyride tour. Sure. Which includes Texas. We do like you know Houston, Dallas, Austin, and then Santa Fe, and then Denver and Frisco, Colorado, and then just like back towards the middle of the country all kind you know minneapolis uh madison omaha i've never even been to omaha it's like you know playing in all right. these places i've never even been which will be really fun and sure. uh st louis chicago of course and right. uh et cetera, et cetera. yeah that'll be that'll be really fun and then until then i have a gig on saturday uh in miami beach with dumps to funk it's dumps to mm -hmm. funk and, nice. and us talk about many bass players in one place they have two for the record um and uh then the following weekend i'm playing the capitol theater and the sherman theater opening for pigeons playing ping pong so these are uh, my next few weekends yeah i've got uh, i've got some gigs y'all it's nice to have gigs it's fun gigs are good. so yeah gigs are good. karina reichman.com slash tour that's where you find all the dates <laughs> in one place come on so yeah, it's we, all happening. like people people like we should people people should know by now like how to <laughs> how to find that right i hope so like I we, hope we so. end we end each each episode usually with like hey we're, we're, if we're somebody wanted to find it yeah like they fucking know well they, they should, they until know. you go to a place and then you're like instagram posts like oh i had such a great time in minneapolis tonight and then they're like oh i didn't even know you were coming what are you doing or like when are you coming to my city and you're like it's like i, I missed just it there. i missed it yeah totally it's just like wait what i had no idea you were coming to chicago i'm like how many times do i have to post about chicago until well, that's you realize the algorithm, though. i'm coming that's, to chicago right yeah. that's the algorithm though I like know. you know like that's it like so many people that you follow you only see like a fraction of a percent of their content you know it's so right. true yeah that's it's so and, true it's and they uh, yeah that's that's a pain in the butt but yeah. um, um you know well, i had a question about uh school you went to nyu mm -hmm. um you, you so you start this live music career really like in your teenage years like as a high schooler um what was the path to nyu we know what's beyond nyu but like right. where did you what did, what did you go to school for I, I went to the School of Individualized Study, which is called Gallatin, where you can create your own major. You could take classes at all the NYU schools to best suit your thing. And you call your concentration something, and mine was called Invention and Distribution in Contemporary Music. So and like Montessori was... for young adults. <laughs> exactly, pal. That, you nailed that's it. That's awesome. You nailed it. I mean, you know, it was basically, you know, the invention being the intangible, you know, creative side of music and the distribution being the business side. Because that, by the way, the whole time I was working for a company called Rocks Off, which is a, a promoter here in Manhattan that, uh, you know, the flagship event was the concert cruise. And they would, you know, we would put bands on boats and take them around New York in you know the hudson the east river for three hours and have a crazy party 
and then come back and that was the flagship event we did that with a million bands and you know i worked my way i was the gm of the company i worked there for seven and a half years this i started the summer right before nyu so between high school and nyu is when i started and i quit in right before the pandemic in 2020 which is funny because the pandemic would have you know made me quit anyway and whatever but that's sort of when my you know they say don't quit your day job till your night job starts paying but like my night job had been paying for a minute and i was like definitely you know always in the tour van you know doing calls and emails and talking to agents and doing all this stuff and it was like very stressful but also incredible and i learned so much and uh jake sufnerowski is my my boss and you know still does it and also he books the starland ballroom now in new jersey and blah 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 he's an incredible talent buyer an incredible guy i just learned so much about the business and had you know it's rare you know you have a i had a full salary all throughout nyu yeah. and that's what i was doing all while playing in five bands going nowhere yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean and like and then i joined marco's band right um at my last year you know and but before then i mean i was in i had lots of bands with my friends and different stuff i was also like you know, I played, you know, on America's Got Talent in a backing band with a flame spewing helmet on my head. I like I did all kinds of weird. We got to that. Yeah, yeah, we got to cut to that right now. I can, uh, I can get you the link to that. No problem. I played, with, <laughs> played with like a six-year-old girl and her like eight-year-old brother or whatever. It was unbelievable, unbelievable stuff. Radio City Music Hall, you know. <laughs> unreal but anyway yeah no i mean i did plenty of i you know i was obsessed with music the whole point of all of this is like i all all i wanted whether it was playing or working in it or taking tickets at the door or scrubbing the fucking floors like i didn't care i just fell in love with music and wanted to be around it yeah f from the age of like 12 or 13 and then really solidified at 15. At 15, it was just like, all right, like this is, this is, you know, I saw like maybe, you know, all throughout high school, I was seeing like four or five nights of live music a week, you know, and getting A's and like, you know, I graduated from Gallatin with honors and like had everything going, you know what I mean? I kept it all going, even though I was touring the country and doing this and doing that and having a full time job. And it's crazy years of my life when you think about it. But you know what they say if you want something done, ask a busy person. That's some real <laughs> shit. I got well, busy, a lot done. Busy has become so like Vogue as well, yeah. you know. So totally. I, I, I take I take people's busyness with a grain of salt most of the time. But you're you're definitely you you've definitely like walked the walk. That's for sure. Um, and, and so while you were studying at NYU, what was your thesis about? It was about both the intangible and you know creative sides of music merging with the business it was about all of that and just sort of the duality of my life at the time which of course you know has gone on to represent the duality of my life now you know and so many texts and various things that you know came to influence all that and that you know in inspired me along the way i wrote about all kinds of shit in that regard you know and i took lots of classes you know i took songwriting classes and blah 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 but also like you know amanda petrosic who's now yeah you know, she was at the time and is still like an incredible and well-renowned rock critic you know she writes in the new york times and the new yorker and all kinds of you know she's amazing and whatever but she was my teacher and i took you know writing about popular music with her and i took you know we did uh independent studies together and like did all kinds of cool stuff all while you know Gallatin was super pro internship so yeah. while I'm getting paid by rocks off that's also my internship that lasted four years you know what I mean so I took three classes a semester with my job counting as a course you know what I mean so all of those things and just talking about all of my experiences both on the road and at the job and you know what is talent buying what you know what i mean and like that my my thesis was about all these things you know and how they all sort of come to meet each other in the middle and what it represented to me at the time and you know thankfully it represents uh something similar to me now you know it was uh a reflection of what i wanted to do it was like come hell or high water it's going to be either this or this and hopefully a combination of the two or at least hopefully i have an understanding of the co you know combination of the two little i had no idea i'd be a professional musician then i didn't i was too realistic you know what i mean like yeah I, there, there wasn't a clear path forward for me for most of that time in performing music you know what i mean it was like i thought 
I'd work for Rocks Off and then I'd work for Live Nation or whatever. I'd work for AEG. I'd work for Ticketmaster. I would do something on the business side because there was a clear path forward for me there. And I was very young with a very robust CV or whatever, a very robust, uh, you know, what do you call it? <laughs> a CV is like, my parents are both professors at Columbia. That's what you call a, a resume. A resume. A resume. Yeah. yeah, totally. And, anyway. and, uh, and, and uh, your, your parents are professors in psychology. Is that right? No, my, my dad's a philosopher. My philosophy, I'm philosophy. sorry. Yeah, and right. my mom's uh, teaches French. That's amazing. Yeah, totally. So there's that, and they were very cool about, you know, I grew up, you know, in upper Manhattan on the Upper West Side, and I just wanted to go downtown. You know, that's also where the music was, you know what I mean? I wanted to be like, no, like, Upper West Side was great, amazing place to grow up, like, beyond. But, like, I was like, no, you know, NYU, like, I think that's where I belong. And once we found out about Gallatin, like, talk about, it's a great place if you're self-motivated, which I was to the nth degree, you know what I mean? But if you're not, I mean, you can definitely fall into weird laziness and strange traps there you know what i oh, mean people so, like, do that when they have like a really strict like curriculum you totally, know like you totally. know that's so it just it really comes down to the type of person certainly i super agree i super agree yeah those were those years man those were those years and yeah high school was you know <laughs> spent playing so much music uh, and you know seeing so much music and of course my college years were too but like i was working you know so like obviously i was seeing a ton of music but like it was like oh man i can't see the tool show because i have to work the sick of it all boat or whatever you know what i mean yeah. like it, things got you know but whereas in high school it was just like okay we're going to this then we're going to this we're going to this we're going on fish tour we're going to go you know see metallica in four states and then we're going to go see slayer in seven states and then we're going to come back and see widespread panic like you know whatever it was all it was all that you know, it, it's so nice. It's so like encouraging to hear. I've always had this sort of like love hate relationship with New York. Um, and, and like you hear about these people who've built really amazing careers as musicians, artists and stuff who grew up in New York. And they it seemed like for the majority of them, they grew up in a specific time or like mm -hmm. there was like a cutoff at some point. So it's just nice to hear when younger people, like, you know, a younger generation uh, who also grew up in New York and is doing the exact same thing and, and like, like doing all those things. And it's just like, it, it it's gives me hope that New York still got it, <laughs> you know, still got it, man. It's a little different. It's a little different. But I mean, you know, we'll talk about, you know, the city that's the most traversable you know, and the most, like the highest concentration of insanely different types of people in one spot. And you can eat any food you want at any hour of the night. And you can eat the most expensive meal or the least expensive meal. And you just have to find it, man. And the people are making music. You just gotta find them because there's such a fucking insanely huge concentration of people right. here. And you can walk to them and you can take subways to them. And they have like, you know, rehearsal studios that are the sizes of closets but it doesn't matter man that goes back to the gear it's all good we're making do with what we have here in new york it's like uh you know obviously things are easier quote unquote theoretically if you have more space right and like more bang for your buck and stuff like that but like again it's about the concentration of people you're you know it's it's a super small place with public transportation that goes to all corners of it with all types of people who live here you know what i mean in various pockets of it and people are invariably in concentrations that are that large doing cool shit and it's not just there i don't know i i still keep in touch with my advisor at nyu who teaches a songwriting class too and it's amazing to hear from him like you know these kids who just come here wide-eyed and ready to go and they're meeting each other and they're playing music and they're learning all this shit and like you know their first moments in new york coming together with this community in NYU, like finding, you know, each other. And I hope they go on to live together and make music and, you know, split rent and keep your costs low so you can do this and that. Like, I don't know, it exists here for sure. You can you can make it work. You just got to find your people, you know? For me, I mean, being from here, you just, that's the whole thing. It's like people fight 
so hard to come here and it is hard if you don't know anybody and you don't know what to do or where to go like of course it's hard it's fucking insane it's like doggy dog crazy money making manhattan out here you know but like you know when you're born and raised you just are all it's like okay so like i'm already here and i have my roots here my parents are here i go up and see my parents all the time it's like super you know when you when you've laid roots somewhere and especially somewhere like this that's just like oh you a crazy know, place right? It's all you know. And of course, like, I don't know. It's just every I, I, I none of that was lost on me for a second from the moment I was born. I knew that this was a special place and that people fight their asses off to be here and that it's not easy for everybody. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's that's some real shit, you know, so to be blessed enough to be here already and have my roots here and know, you know, you when you go to, you know, you just you've met everybody, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I have a friend here and a friend here. I know that like, if I'm in any part of Manhattan, I'll be like, Oh, I'll call so-and-so I'll see if they're around, you know, you swing by and it's like, Hey, how are you? You know, whatever. Like, it's just a, it's an incredible place to be. And again, like talk about being in a walkable city and you know, I don't have a driver's license or anything, you know, but you're so also like, funny. you know, close to Jersey, close to Philly. Right. And that's yes. a musician, you know, like, all right, let's go. You know, we can go, you can same day it to Philly, same day it to Jersey and like play gigs, uh, you know, in Ashburg or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and Long Island is big, you know, and Boston's not far and DC's right. not far. Like there's a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And it's great. Yeah. When we tour the Northeast, it's like, boom, 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 boom. Like right. major city, major city, major city, major city. It's really fun. You know? Yeah. We, we I, got uh, Chicago and a little bit of Wisconsin <laughs> here. And I feel like that's about it. You know, uh, sure. Indianapolis isn't very big and Iowa isn't very big. Uh, but yeah, that East Coast, I feel like any touring I've done, like East Coast was like it was just a really like exciting vibe. And everybody was like really into the shows I played and were really like, I, you know, I've had some conversations with some like veteran musicians of Chicago. And I don't know that the scene is super healthy. I mean, I think there's like certain scenes that are healthy here, but then I think like, there's just, it's like the city's so segregated and it's the winters are really rough on people. So it's hard between the sure. September and March to get anybody to come to a show. Uh, and it's okay. a dice roll, you know, because you may, you know, you're like, all right, I'm going to play, november 15th on saturday and then the 14th hits and it's like sub-zero you know we got six inches of snow and nobody wants to come out type like, of thing. oh my god yeah, yeah. totally um, i can imagine Jeez, yeah i'm coming at the worst possible time right february touring the Midwest. Uh, great perfect okay. <laughs> okay good well okay. It, i'll i don't know necessarily agree with mark it's a gamble like if it's it snowing or it's ultra cold it you know it's right it, it's oh. gonna affect your draw you know but like oh we're already gotta... we're 15 tickets to yeah. sold out like we're good oh, we're oh, totally you're good. Right. you know you're fine people will come yeah, out. yeah. It's, i'm it's not worried about that element i'm just worried about you know sliding off the road and stuff like that that's a thing too that's the gamble <laughs> that's that the is gamble. The truth, oh i don't care truth. about how many people are there like i mean i do but you know what i mean right. like that's secondary to like you know dying on the black ice that's uh you know are you guys concern number one are you doing the two? Are you touring in like just a regular old van or you got like the sprinter? What's the sprinter? Sprinter van. That's yeah. it. No trailer, just a sprinter. Five, five with dudes. The auto, well, with the auto correction. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Four dudes and a lady. It's, uh, it's going to oh, be great. The, We're going to make it. We're going to make it. You know, all the oh, touring boy. that I've done, it's like, oh man, just like being in such close quarters with people for such extended periods of time. Sure. Lucky to get shot hours and lucky to whatever and yeah and i was i was in a band a female fronted band for many years um so i'm familiar with Sick. with that situation um so yeah well have fun with the Thanks. tour <laughs> I look um, forward to it i look forward to yeah, the smell I mean, it was some of all. the best times of my great. life you know for sure doing some tour oh yeah um mark you got anything else before we jump into these rapid fire questions I, th I was just gonna say, let, I think it's I think it's perfect time to jump into rapid fire. All right, so I got Whoa. I got a list of about ten questions or sh or so. Mark might jump in. They're all usually base related. Sometimes Mark likes to add in food related questions, so you might, you might get one of those. But uh, so these are just you know fun, quick questions. First thing that kind of pops in your mind, and you know, tell me what you think. So, are you ready? 
I'm ready. All right, here we go. Uh, active or passive bases? Passive. Uh, maple or rosewood or ebony, favorite fretboard? Maple. All right. Uh, do you have a favorite uh, speaker size? 10, 12, 15, 18? Four tens. Let's say that. Let's nice. say that. Uh, do you prefer a combo amp or like head having it separate thing? Head and a cab. Separate. Right. Keep them separate. Yeah. Uh, this is the hardest question for everyone. Uh, favorite bass player or name a few of your favorite bass players. Ooh. Dave Drywitz. All right. Getty Lee. All right. Cliff Burton. Okay. Can I keep going? Oh, One yeah. more. Tina Weymouth. All right. Oh, nice. You're the second person, uh, and I think two podcasts to say Tina. Uh, Tina's the shit. That's why. Uh, I represent Tina, you know? Come on. Come on. Uh, do you have a piece of gear you regret getting rid of? Ooh. Wow. Not so much. I'm sort of like, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, I'm somehow a minimalist in all of this. So I feel like when I clear things out, it's just to, you know, make room for the better stuff to either come or whatever. No, I, I have, I will, I will go on the record and say, I have no regrets with getting rid of anything. And, uh, you know, le less is more. It's great. It's great. Are you into Marie Kondo, you know, like the <laughs> life changing art of tidying up does not spark joy. Exactly. I mean, I'm into it naturally. I don't, you know, I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I, I like to keep, uh, you know, I you ask my boyfriend, I love throwing things away. It's great. <laughs> um, do you prefer a hard case or a gig bag? Gig bag, mono, mono, uh, mono gig bag with a nice little tick attachment. Let me tell you, nice. nice. love the tick. Uh, tube or solid state amps? Tube. All right. Uh, you mentioned your current rig is the Tone Hammer 700, right? And, uh, Aguil the AG, the AG 700. AG 700, and they have. But uh, also see, I think, a Bergantino head back there sitting on the, the counter. So maybe we'll see you play that a little bit. The Bergantino uh, cab is on its way to me as we speak. Ooh. They just built me something very, very sick, and I'm wildly excited about it. And, uh, I mean, I feel like I, I can't even divulge what it is yet because right. it's so exciting. And I have Chris Benson building me an amp as well, and that's going to be two 15 Nice inch cabinets, and it's a it's a B seven hundred, um, you know, yeah, head, and it's going to be absolutely sick. So I'm going from being, you know, one amp Reichman right. to three amp Reichman. It's going to be really exciting. It's going to be very cool. cool. Yeah, very it's going to cool. be good. Um, I think we already mentioned this, but what's your favorite pedal? My favorite bass pedal uh -huh. is probably the Octave, the Tim LaFave three leaf audio uh -huh. octave pedal. I think that's also but, the you know one. close second close second to the rat because you know yes <laughs> right. uh, I uh, <laughs> yeah. I think Ryan Stasick also mentioned that as being his favorite pedal from Umbridge mm -hmm. McGee. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite string brand size type? Diadario. Uh huh. Flat wounds only. Oh shit! Flat wounds. I'm a flat. I'm a flat gal. Uh -huh. it ain't do flat, you play? Do you play? Uh, like do do you like like? let them age for a long time or do you oh yeah baby them? oh yeah. yeah i learned from my <laughs> my girl my girl laura lee taught me you yeah. know uh she like has never changed the strings on any of her bases and i was like well cool i like the way you sound so i'm gonna be like you i'm gonna do that you know and there is something to like i really like it when it's like warm and dead and you know really buttery and you kind of get that from letting them sit for for yeah. a long time as opposed to like super bright or Right. Super 80s kind of vibes. That's sort of not what I'm doing. Cool. Uh, do you have a favorite hardware finish? Black, chrome, gold, nickel. Gold. Gold. Everything gold. Gold all yeah. the way. Yeah. Uh, do you have thoughts and feelings about relic instruments? I like them. That, no more need. End of list. <laughs> uh, and then... Uh, this has become uh, a favorite question, and the last question I'll have. Um, a band you wish you could play with or maybe do a tour with or do an album with? Is there a band you wish oh, you could be a part of? I I would love, I mean, just in, if I'm going to insert myself into a band, uh -huh. let's call it Nine Inch Nails. Let's call it, <laughs> let's, let's end there, because I, I would freak out. I would yeah. freak out. 
That's the one Tim just mentioned. Tim Lefebvre. Just yeah. mentioned. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Well, go great minds, man. Right. Great minds. There you go. Uh, you're in good company. Uh, Mark, you got any questions? Pizza or tacos? <laughs> Ooh, uh, pizza. Favorite pizza place in New York City? Joe's. Soup or chili? Soup. Chocolate candy or fruity candy? This is important. Chocolate candy. That's the right answer. What's your favorite? What's your favorite chocolate candy bar? Snickers. And would you prefer peanut butter Snickers or regular Snickers? Regular Snickers. The OG. The OG regular Snickers. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. What's your favorite fruity candy? Ooh. I mean, probably the uh, the very illustrious Sour Patch Kid. Because once you pop, you can't stop, you know? Mm. That's real I like shit. this. Uh, yeah. That's that's all I've got right now. <laughs> I like those, though. I like those. Super chilly. Fucking A. Let's go. What I mean, that's a real... That's a... Well, like, question, the question man. is like think of the best chili you've ever had and think of the best soup you've ever had it's got to be soup but you got to realize like chili you know i feel like chili is is you know unless you like are just a diehard chili guy you know soup is so open-ended here right. there are so many types of soup right that it leaves you open to i think the possibility of of being like oh well there's this and there's that and there's this and there's that you know what i mean whereas chili I Chili's chili, man. But I do love it. I do, I do. love it. Right. But soup. <laughs> What's your favorite soup? Oh, what is my favorite soup? You know, chili. lobster bisque. <laughs> lobster bisque. Ooh, lobster bisque. Ooh. I mean, do you like it you. like? Do you like it like uh like? sort of smooth do you like it chunky like what's your what's your good i like it smooth but i'm not gonna send it back if there's a good <laughs> amount of lobster meat in there that's just chilling you know what i mean that hasn't been blended that's uh you know so i'd say smooth with some lobster you know like some real lobster thrown in there karina's a happy girl let me tell best you. best lobster bisque you've ever had oh my god i've had you know eventide uh which is a restaurant up in portland maine they kind of do everything of that ilk, I would say, the best, you know? And, man, sometimes they have a lobster bisque special that just knocks your socks off, baby. Shout out. Jody, Eventide. Jody, we're yeah. fucking going. We're going oh, to Eventide. Go. Well, listen, in go. lobster. I, yeah. I mean, I've, I literally think I've played Portland, Maine more than anywhere in the U.S. <laughs> just to go to <laughs> For Eventide. the past two years, it's all about Eventide. you got to go. You I've just never been go. to Maine, so I would Oh, to baby. I'll have to. So, so quick, Jody. quick, quick soup story. Yeah. Um, just all this reminded me of a quick superstar. There's a, there's a bass player. I'm not going to name who they are. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's not a very flattering story, but it's a true okay. story. Uh, had a I hosted an event with this bass player. It was a great event. And then afterwards, uh, me and some coworkers took this bass player to a restaurant nearby. Okay. Uh, this person is like, you know, East coaster full of opinions. Well, it's not afraid to share them. And uh, we get to the restaurant. We, uh, we he orders a lobster bisque as well, and he gives the waiter it's it's just specific instructions. Make it as hot as possible. Wow! It needs to be as hot temperature as possible. Yeah. And they're like, okay, well, we 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 it comes out pretty hot. And he's like, whatever it is, I need it to be a little bit hotter. Wow. And she's like, okay. Comes back, gives him the soup, takes a bite just grumpy poopy pants just sitting there she comes up how's everyone's food was your soup hot enough and he goes not even close oh and come sends on it back, sends no. it back. and like all of us all of us are sitting there just like oh what dear what the fuck is happening right that's now that's not what you want it's just not what you want but that's <laughs> okay respect enough. respect you know but also that's not what you want no you can't no. Uh, well it was you can't like, be doing that <laughs> i i was i was sort of torn i was like i really respect someone who just they have standards they asked for it. They were very specific about it. And then the other side of me who empathizes with, you know, hospitality, it's just like, come on, dude. Like, I mean, it's this, is, this is a bar. This is a bar that has food. You it's know like, what I mean? Saddle down, Francis. <laughs> There's no need. We don't need to have the fucking, put it in know, the microwave for you. <laughs> I'm an elite Yelper. I've uh, written over 2,000 reviews. Oh, I, uh, I have, I have standards. <laughs> Wow, guys. I mean, this has just been illuminating on more than one level, I would say. Would you agree? <laughs> I, I would, yeah. You know, the 400-degree soup. Oh, my God. I mean, now we have Jody's dog is up in here. What's the dog's name? Tell us more. Hello, baby. How you doing? 
This is garbage. Oh my god, little, little baby. Little garbage. So cute. Garbage I'm is dying. seven years old. And he just wants to. I had to leave uh, an hour, a half hour ago because he was barking at the door because he wanted to come. He is, he is really spectacular. Really, he's, truly. He's just he is the snuggliest, bugliest yeah. dog ever. I, it's, every time I come over, he just like jumps in. He's just like, I'm here on your lap now. We're, yeah, best, we're best buds. He just wants to sit on your lap all you day. You could tell. You could tell. Yeah, he's, he's so sweet. So sick here. Little garbage. Wow. Well, Karina, thank you so much for joining us, indulging us, um, and, and sharing like your pearls of wisdom. Um, yeah, I think that's all we've got, right? I think this that's is fantastic. It. And then they can all find you at your website, which is KarinaReichman.com. Absolutely. Y K M A N. Correct. Correct. K A R I N A. Um, yes, all of them. And it's all just my first name and my last name at Karina Reichman. Thanks for having me, guys. What a blast. Yeah, Come on. Awesome. Thank you for, for joining us.